Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. So well, hockey fever is heating up in BC. As you can see, the Vancouver Canucks play game one in the playoffs on Sunday. Not to mention the Prince George Cougars and the Kelowna Rockets battling it out in the Western Conference Finals. Well, what do you love about watching or participating in hockey? In about half an hour, Brian Minter is back and he'll talk about bringing a pop of color to your container garden. And as always, he's taking your gardening questions. I'm Michelle Elliott. Welcome to BC Today. Thanks for joining us on CBC Radio 1, CBC Television, and live streaming on the CBC News app, cbc.ca slash bc, and on the CBC Vancouver YouTube page. And you can call us now on our top story. What do you love about watching or participating in hockey? Do you have any playoff traditions or superstitions? You can call us 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733. You can also hit pound 690 on your cell phone. You can email bctoday at cbc.ca. We'll talk about beating expectations. The Vancouver Canucks had a tumultuous 2023, which included their coach getting replaced last January, but this year started off strong. And this Sunday, they kick off their playoff run against the Nashville Predators. You can feel the energy here in Vancouver. As you can see, I'm getting ready to get on the bandwagon myself. I'm wearing a borrowed Canucks jersey right now. Let's hear from some fans in Vancouver. Pumped. Big year. The season has been great. I'm looking forward to the playoffs. Been uh, watching all the games. <laughs> very, very excited for the playoffs, definitely. Uh, I've been a fan for 13, 14 years, and I got to say, I definitely wasn't expecting us to do as well as we did this year. I don't think anybody was. Uh, and yeah, I like our chances going into it. They definitely have a chance. Fingers crossed that they do, because I've been waiting my whole lifetime for it. And my mom and dad, they've been waiting their whole lifetimes too. So. Would love to see it. I know uh, the city deserves it, all the fans. Well, hockey fever is happening elsewhere in the province too. Diehard fans in Prince George and Kelowna are rallying behind their teams. Both have made it to the Western Conference semifinals. The Prince George Cougars and the Kelowna Rockets play game three of their series tonight in Kelowna. And right now it's two to zero for Prince George. I know my colleagues there are very excited about it. Now well, you can call us now, whether you are a diehard loyal fan or a bandwagoner like some of us, you can call 1-800-825-5950-604-669-3733. What do you love about watching or perhaps playing hockey yourself? And what are your own hockey playoff traditions? And uh, we have two guests. We actually didn't have to go very far to find people who are excited about these hockey playoffs. Joining me here in Vancouver is our intern, Lachlan Irvine, who also writes for the Canucks Army. And he's written for Canucks Army for like 10 years now. Um, just two. I mean, I've been writing about the Canucks for the past uh, ten, the past 10 the years past. in some capacity. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Finding local blogs you can write for. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's half the battle sometimes. Anywhere I can write. And in Prince George, we're joined by CBC journalist Jason Peters. Hi, Jason. Hello, Michelle. Uh, great to have you on with us. Okay, let's start off. I want to give you both a chance to let it out. Uh, how excited are you, Lachlan? I'm really excited. You know, this is the the first time the Canucks have made the playoffs uh, outside of the, the COVID year in quite a while. Obviously, that year was such a different experience in terms of how getting into the playoffs. There was the play and round and everything. All the games were in Edmonton in front of no fans. Right. Uh, this is the first time since 2015 that they're going to be hosting a game at Rogers Arena, a playoff game. Oh. And that's a whole generation of fans that have not really seen Vancouver at it pure hockey fever like it was back in say 2011 when I was growing up a little bit so yeah the ability to see Vancouver get back into hockey seeing people who maybe are maybe weren't big Canucks fans coming into this season kind of jumping on board is it's always fun to see nice and uh, do we dare look back at 2011 
I mean, not if we can help it too much, yeah. but y you know, obviously that that was such a fun that was such a fun run. Even like the the, yeah, the good it was. parts outweigh the bad ones for sure. Yeah, well, it was a longer time anyway, and until the night of 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 the riot. Um, but certainly, I was talking to Rob Zimmerman yesterday about the electricity in the air here in downtown Vancouver because they had the big screens and people were coming out to watch, and there were just. Good vibes everywhere. So let's hope that all continues. Uh, and Jason, what about you? So tell us about you know what's happening among Prince George Cougars fans. The uh, the level of excitement in Prince George is uh, something that we haven't seen since the uh, late 1990s, early 2000s, wow. uh, when Prince George had some good teams. So people have been waiting a long time for this to have a team of such quality that is is pegged to go quite deep in the playoffs for yourself got, well go ahead go ahead we've got um sold out buildings uh throughout playoffs so far and wow. that's going to be the case again uh tonight uh when the teams actually play game five it, it's game five tonight in prince george and oh, prince pardon george me. has a chance to okay. to wrap up the series tonight so there's a lot of anticipation for tonight's game huh. uh with the possibility of prince george moving on to the next round okay so how is the series shaping up then so right now um prince george won the first two games by shutout mm -hmm. and and then they won the third game in Kelowna in overtime uh, but then Kelowna uh, got back into the series with a a two to one win on uh, Wednesday night. So yes, now we're at Game Five with uh, Prince George having a chance to wrap it up. And Prince George plays in front of um, a, they they play in a six thousand seat arena, and all of those tickets for tonight um, are gone wow. after the last game. They sold out uh, in a matter of hours uh, because people are so excited to to be in that building and, and be in that atmosphere. Wow, hours, you say. Okay, so what you your correction to me just kind of exemplifies why I feel a little bit awkward in this Canucks jersey right now because I am so much just a bandwagoner with little to no knowledge <laughs> of the actual Canucks. Um, how do you guys, how do you feel about, you know, in 2011, I went through the same thing where I just, you know, started going to the to family hockey parties and just got so into it. I was right up front in the living room, you know, watching and cheering. But how do you feel about people who kind of just hitch on to, to bandwagons, luckily? In a way, it's almost that those people are just smarter than me because <laughs> they are the ones that go, oh, why would I watch a team that's losing all the time or not, not doing anything of note, right? Whereas I sat there and watched so many losing efforts over the last few years <laughs> that I kind of question if that was the best use of my time. But at the end of the day, it's... Uh, at the end of the day, it's so it's so good to see um, even like ca the casual fans like picking up on the team because I think the because a hockey team can't really survive without getting the the groundswell of of people who are new to hockey or yeah. people or bringing in new fans and new groups of people who have maybe either moved from somewhere else and don't have not haven't experienced hockey before or just anyone who is just only uh, watches hockey w when there's something when there's something big happening it's getting those people to come into to the into the building and buy the merch and uh and uh pay for tickets like those are the those are the fans that you need to you need to bring in and it and it it makes just the it makes everyone better for it when you can have a wide variety of fans. I'm glad you're not bringing out, you know, moral superiority for having put in the time. <laughs> yeah. Again, <laughs> it's a case of you could watch 82 games if they lose all 82, but is that really is that is that always the best use of someone's time? I'm not going to tell someone else that they're that they shouldn't do that, that they should do that, that they should do that. I I chose to, but that doesn't mean it's the right call. <laughs> Hopefully you had good snacks. For sure, yeah. for sure. Plenty of good snacks absolutely <laughs> there you go uh well okay so we're putting it out there right even if you are a casual fan just getting into uh canucks hockey right now or you're in prince george you're in Kelowna, you're getting excited about your teams um or you're a longtime loyal fan you know a season ticket holder we want, to, want you to call in, let us know uh, what do you love about watching hockey or what about uh, what do you love about participating in hockey? If you play yourself, if you have kids who play, what is it that you enjoy? Our numbers are 
5950-604-669-3733. You can hit pound 690 on your cell phone. And you can email us too, bctoday at cbc.ca. And let me go back to Jason Peters and Prince George then. Um, how do you feel? I mean, 6,000 people suddenly buying tickets. Not all of them can be loyal fans who stuck it out since the 90s. That is very true. <laughs> we went through a long stretch of time in Prince George where most of those 6,000 seats uh, were empty. Uh, we we oh. would literally have game nights where uh, 500 to 1,000 people would show up. And and that was sort of the, the low point for, for the franchise, I think. But uh, this team has been building for the last few seasons now. And so interest has slowly been coming back. Uh, I'm not going to say that we had sellout buildings all the way through uh, the end of the season here because we didn't. So people have definitely been getting on the bandwagon for playoffs. Uh, I know from talking to some longtime season ticket holders uh, just in the last uh, few days that they're actually happy to see the so-called bandwagon fans uh, back in the building because it just brings that life and that energy and that passion back into the arena. And one fan that I spoke with, he said that he feels a uh, a full building is worth at least one extra goal for the Cougars during the game because it pumps them up to have uh, extra bums in seats. So I think if you were to ask the players, they're just happy that there are fans in the building and that those fans are soaking it all in and really getting behind the team. Well, we have some of that tape that you collected when you went out to the CN Center in Prince George. Let's take a listen now. Hi, uh, Bob Halla. From uh, I live at Summit Lake, but I've uh, been a Cougar fan since well when they came to town. I'm proud to be a 30-year guy for the, these Cougars, and, and Prince George needs it. I, I just wish people would uh, accept them for the win losses or whatever. But hockey's a fickle sport. But I'm a, I'm a sincere uh, fan of it all, and it's been a great year. Great young men playing hockey. That's what I enjoy. Uh, hi, my name is Shane. All the way, Memorial Cup. Been saying it all year, we're going to the finals, man. And this is our year. As long as we stay healthy, I think we can, well, I think we can go a long ways. So that's what I'm hoping anyways. We're winning the championship this year. Let go Cougars. Let go Cougars. Let go Cougars. Uh, hockey is a fickle sport, um, indeed, as we've heard. Uh, Jason, how did it feel for you to speak to to those fans? It was it was fun. It, it's been a long time since people in Prince George have been this passionate about their team. Uh, so it's it's tough not to get uh, caught up in in the excite the right. excitement of it all. Uh, you know, I've I've been watching the team for many years myself. Uh, and, and gone through some of those lean times. My son, who is uh, 23 years old now uh, and follows the team closely, he says that he's been waiting for this his whole life. And uh, even during the away games, he's been watching from from his uh, from his home uh, on uh, streaming, and he's had 10, 12 people watching with him, and they're they're cheering along just like they're at the rink. So. All of those, uh, all of those young folks that maybe haven't witnessed this before, uh, they're really enjoying it too. So it, it's really been fantastic for the whole community. Whether you're a longtime hockey fan who has seen this once before back in the '90s or early 2000s, or whether you're experiencing it now for the first time. Um, uh, Lachlan, that that uh, quote really sticks up for me. Hockey is a fickle sport. Uh, I was reading the Athletic, and they had said, you know, about the Canucks and about the Predators, what a year, what a difference a year makes. Um, what has been that turnaround for the Vancouver Canucks? Well, I mean, it starts definitely on the bench with Rick Tockett. I mean, the he came into last season with a this the locker room was in a lot a lot of disarray. They're just the team was not clicking. Uh, they were losing a lot of games that they probably should have been winning. Mm. And as this was coming off of already having made a coaching change just the year before with right. with Bruce Boudreaux replacing Travis Green, and then so, Rick Tockett replacing him. Right, and then Rick Tockett comes in, and and, uh, and Canucks fans were already not happy about the way that Bruce Boudreaux was shown the door. There was a lot of uh, er, there were a lot of hurt feelings around that, especially at the time. And so Tockett was coming into a very tough situation, and 
Uh, he's been preaching structure, trying to uh, turn the team around in terms of defensively, trying to get them to play a more cohesive game. And it clicked from day one this year. There was just a different attitude. There was a different um, standard set for winning in that locker room. And it, it's shown, right? And it's shown right out of the gate. They won a lot of games in the early going that last year they definitely wouldn't have won. They're finding mm -hmm. ways to win games and not even without necessarily playing their best effort, which is sometimes like the hardest thing to do and is the mark of a really good team is when you can win games even when you're not playing at 100% of your best level. And Nashville is- playing smarter. Yeah, yeah, they're, it's about playing smarter and using that and using the opportunities when you get them. Mm -hmm. And the Canucks have done that beautifully this year. Nashville is, an, is a team that has kind of, uh, they went to the Stanley Cup final back, I think in, I wanna say 2017. Um, they've kind of, you've kind of seen the downturn, a bit of a changing of the guard for them with Pecorine retiring in goal, Yusei Saros coming in. They got a new coach themselves in Andrew Brunette, um, new GM and Barry Trotz. Uh, the first half of the season was not great from their perspective. You kind of, it kind of looked like it had it the year before, but uh, right around the middle of the season, there was a, uh, it's, it's often credited that um, there after a game in Vegas, the coaching staff canceled a team trip to uh, the a U2 concert in Vegas at the, the Vegas Sphere. <laughs> And suddenly they just went on this massive run, run winning streak. And it's been a, it's been two different teams essentially for Nashville. So they're coming in looking completely different, completely more uh, of a challenge than they would have at the early. Parts. Okay. Cancel tickets to a concert. Cancel tickets that's, to a concert. Yeah. Apparently that's, that's the winning strategy. Exactly. Okay. Message to coaches out there. Uh, we're asking you, what are your own um, hockey playoff traditions? And are you excited about the Canucks making it to the playoffs? Or if you are uh, getting behind your Kelowna team, uh, the Kelowna Rockets or the Prince George Cougars, we'd love to hear from you in the interior and the North. 1-800-825-5950. 604-669-3733. You can hit pound 690 on your cell phone. Michelle is joining us from Abbotsford. Hi, Michelle. Hi there, Michelle. Can you hear me, Michelle? I think we have lost our connection. Michelle grew up in the interior, is a Canucks fan, and has been for a long time. Uh, Michelle in Abbotsford, if you want to give us a call back, it's one 800 825 5950. Eric is up next in Lytton. Hi, Eric. Hi, Eric. Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, nice to hear from you in Lytton. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I remember uh, back in 2011 when the Canucks were playing Boston, and I've always been a Boston fan. My wife made me a great big B Boston symbol, and we put it on the window. Oh, no. And when... Uh, People were driving around with Canucks flags and all that. <laughs> and when uh, when Boston beat them, I actually got my house egged. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm a, I'm afraid that uh, they're going to get knocked out in the first round because they'll always be the Canuckleheads. Oh no! Are you are you a Nashville <laughs> fan? Uh, no, I'm a Boston fan. Just Boston. Okay. All right. So okay for these playoffs. Tell me you're getting on the Canucks bandwagon, though. Oh, no. No. They'll always be the Canucks. Oh, They'll break no. everybody's heart. They'll break everybody's <laughs> heart. It is yeah. an emotional roller coaster, isn't it? Yeah. You betcha. Yeah. Ah, well, are you going to be watching on Sunday, Eric? Oh, yeah. We'll be watching. All mm -hmm. right. Do you have any traditions or anything like that you want to share? Uh, just put another big B on the window. Another. <laughs> <laughs> for no reason at all that's right yeah. uh great to hear from you thank you very much okay and enjoy, enjoy the game that's eric and Lytton. uh lachlan your eyes were just growing wider and wider yeah, <laughs> as I, I mean talking there. I, I gotta get i gotta give him credit that's a that's a that's a tough move to go and uh a bold move to go put the big Bruins B on the window. That's right. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, and I mean, listen, I don't know if the Bruins are going that much farther, if we're being honest here. Ouch. I mean, listen, listen, Toronto, Toronto's got a good team. Obviously, they Toronto's had a hard time putting Boston out in recent years. But uh, f as far as out of that division, Florida's the the team to beat, as far as I'm concerned, the I Panthers. Think I think we are surrounded by some Toronto fans as well. Yes. So uh, they may be wanting to call in. We have an email from Denise who writes, never watched hockey until this year, but a family friend is playing for New York in the 
inaugural season of the newly formed 16 Professional Women's Hockey League. Yes, and I am hooked. I mean, that, Jason, that has infused so much more excitement into hockey, hasn't it, this new league? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and, and it's been a long time coming. Uh, women's, women's hockey has, has been in the shadows for, for way too long. And they've been trying to get a professional league for many, many years now. And so it's been wonderful to see that happen. And it's also been amazing to see the fan support that those teams are getting. And, and once again, it just opens up the game to a whole uh, generation of new female players who are able to now see the possibilities of, of starting out in the game, playing the game, sticking with the game, and then who knows, maybe one day eventually getting to that level where you can play for your country or you can play in a professional league like that one. There's, there, there's just no no negatives about that league. It's all been fantastic ever since the drop of the puck. Yeah, that has just been such an exciting development in the sport uh, this year uh, and much needed as well. So great to speak to both of you. Thank you very much. Uh, any traditions, by the way, just quickly? Um, I mean, I, I used to do, I used to have a tradition in my house where I would just uh, I'd have the towel out on the the playoff towel out yeah. on the on the chair. Yeah. Uh, I'd wear the same jersey until they lost, and then I'd pick a different one, go to a different jersey kind of thing, just to kind of change it up a little bit. That's pretty much my tradition, I would say. And you, Jason? Well, for me this season, it's been all about a pair of slippers. I, I got a pair of slippers uh, um, sort of halfway through the season, yeah. and and my team, which which I won't mention necessarily okay. because this is a this is probably a pro canucks audience <laughs> although but we did you, have the bruins mentioned i know uh, we did but I, I gotta wrap it there but you do have a pair of slippers i do have a pair of slippers that my good luck slippers is intriguing uh thank you so much to both of you cbc intern lachlan irvine who writes for canucks army and in prince george that was cbc journalist jason peters producer with daybreak north it is now 1228, 128 in the Mountain Time Zone. Next week on the early edition, we'll learn about what the return of the playoffs means for local Vancouver businesses. And we're gonna hear from some local restaurants and retailers. I mean, we, we generally are full for every Canucks game, but uh, now the lineup starts earlier. Fans are super excited. We see tons of business for the away games as well. We'll fill the room. That was Murray Saunders from the Shark Club Sports Bar. We'll also find out what some businesses and Vancouver police are doing to ensure safety during the playoffs. Of course, a top concern. So CBC's own Lauren Swat will be digging into this. That is next Tuesday on the early edition on CBC. And today, more of the top stories, of course, on your afternoon shows in your region. And in Metro Vancouver, here's what's coming up on On the Coast. Hello there, Michelle. It's Gloria Makarenko here, um, and I hope you can join us for On the Coast this afternoon. I know a lot of people I know are feeling this. Canucks fans, certainly, they are feeling it big time, getting ready for the postseason. We are going to talk about playoff fever returning to hockey fans across the region. Also, a lot of people are getting ready for the sun run this weekend. Others are celebrating the smaller steps they're taking, though, just doing any kind of fitness at all. So we're going to return to our Spring Into Action series that we've been running this week. I hope you can join us between 3 and 6 this afternoon for On the Coast. Thank you, Gloria. That's Gloria Makarenko with On the Coast. You can tune into her coming up this afternoon, starting at 3 in Metro Vancouver. You can use the CBC Listen app. Well, Vaisakhi Parade organizers are expecting half a million people at tomorrow's Vaisakhi Parade in Surrey. It starts at 9 a.m. at the Gurdwara Sahib Darbar on 85th Avenue. And there'll be food, music, performances, speeches, and of course, parade floats. The CBC will be there, so you can come by and say hi to our team. You can also win a prize, and the parade celebrates one of the most significant days in the Sikh calendar, the creation of Khalsa in 1699. 
Organizers say people of all cultures and communities are welcome to celebrate a communal gathering of understanding, sharing, and goodwill. It is a busy weekend in BC. Now it is 12.30, 1.30 in the Mountain Time Zone. This is BC Today here on CBC. We're on Radio 1, CBC Television, and live streaming on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. You can watch us on YouTube at CBC Vancouver, or you can use the CBC News app. And busy indeed. Our phone lines will be busy in the next hour, next half an hour, because Brian Minter will be here to take your gardening questions. That's coming up after the CBC News update. And here now is Robert Zimmerman. <laughs> Good afternoon. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau is in B.C. today and was speaking at UVic this morning. He told students his government was committing a record amount of money on education. Trudeau says $4.6 billion is being allocated for research and innovation. And this year's budget makes a series of promises to boost homegrown research, education and innovation, including setting aside $30 million to support Indigenous participation. Coquitlam RCMP are investigating a number of fires in that city yesterday. There were three separate incidents and police believe they were all connected and deliberately set. A suspect was arrested near one of the fires in the area of Lougheed Highway and Westwood Street. And a 14-year-old was taken to hospital after a crash at the Prince George Walmart early this morning. RCMP say they were called to the scene just after 2.30 and found the teen's family already there. The collision left a gaping hole in the building and the store was closed to the public this morning. And now the forecast on the north coast. Sunny this afternoon with a high of 18. Highs up to 8 with some sunshine in the peace. In the central interior, including Prince George, sunny with a high of 10 degrees. Highs from 9 to 13 with a mix of sun and cloud in the Kootenays. In the southern interior, including Kelowna, some sun and cloud with a high of 15. And for Metro Vancouver, Greater Victoria and the Fraser Valley, lots of sunshine this afternoon with highs up to 19 inland. That's your CBC News update from Vancouver. I know you missed it. I was wearing uh, Stephen Benick is this uh, hockey jersey. I'm sorry, uh, who's? Uh, S uh, Stephen. Uh, Stephen Benick is his uh, hockey jersey. Our colleague. Oh, Stephen. <laughs> yeah, he ran over I, and lent I, it to I don't, me. I don't know him. He's a member of the Canucks. Yeah, <laughs> he no. Is, no, gotcha. Yeah. 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 Um, well, you know a lot more than I do, uh, but I did don true? a jersey for the previous segment uh, because it is happening this Sunday, Rob. That's right. Yeah, yeah. we're excited. So much. Right? I know. Yes, you're excited, I know. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and lots. There's also um, the Coast City Country Music Festival at BC Place <laughs> okay. this weekend, and mm -hmm. which I have to say, I saw some fabulous cowboy hats yesterday. I was just outside, you know, we're close to BC Place. And uh, I was walking around Robson Street. People are gearing Street. up for that, are they? It sound, it looked like it. Wow. Um, in any case, there must be a fabulous hat festival going on somewhere. Nice. <laughs> and the Sun Run is on Sunday, too. It is a busy weekend. It's a really busy weekend. I think nice. some, some rain, unfortunately. Mm. But uh, I've, I've done the Sun Run in the rain. It is not fun. But you know what? That spirit of community yeah, I don't know if it is it that fun in the sun either. I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't know. I've done it in the sun. It mm. is gorgeous and glorious. Sure. It re it really is. That's it. I'm signing you up next year. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's happening. Sure. Uh, Rob, thanks so much. Have a great weekend. Enjoy thanks, the game, Michelle. okay? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks. Rob, Rob Zimmerman in the CBC Vancouver Newsroom. seeking that pop of spring color in our gardens and Brian Minter is here with tips for colorful plants you can put into your container. Our gardening columnist Brian Minter joins us uh, every couple of weeks. As always, he's here to take your questions as well on anything gardening related. You can call 1-800-825-5950 604-669-3733. You can hit pound 690 on your cell phone. If you want to send your question by email, it's bctoday at cbc.ca. 
And Brian Minter joins me now from Country Gardens um, Limited in Chilliwack. Hello, Brian. Hey, Michelle. Wonderful to be here. Yes. And uh, you're right. Um, you know, we're all looking for a bit of color that the tops and tulips are around and, and you know, they unfortunately have a, a shorter lifespan right. when it, that starts to get a little bit warm. And, uh, you know, we have early perennials, which is which is nice. But, you know, most of us are looking for a real bang on the patio, something that just, you know, shouts hello. Yeah, I'm, I'm here. It's bright and <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Welcome. And, <laughs> welcome. And, um, you know, it's it's still a ways. And, and we were out in the valley, uh, gosh, a couple nights ago, we had quite a hard frost. And, uh, and for the wow. valley, by the way, April 19th is the last frost date. Well, we're there, and we're still getting cool nights. So let's have a different strategy. And uh, we've been doing this for years and trying to help folks out, give them ideas in terms of what is going to look good, not for just a short period of time, but something that's going to give us a lot of bang for uh, the, the color and the, and the containers we have. First of all, um, like a bigger container, if we pause it again, when you have a critical mass of soil, and, and by the way, mentioning soil, very open, very porous, mm. um, no, no, just, you know, inexpensive potting. So you need something that the roots of all the plants can get out there and grow and, and be happy. And when we get rain on the plants or, you know, somebody waters a little bit, the excess gets away. So a very open, porous, well-grained soil. Now, so what type of plants are we looking at? And this is something very different. It's not the, the usual stuff. Um, what I love to have is a lot of broad-leafed evergreens. And after this winter, where you know it did quite a significant damage on many of our containers, well, as a matter of fact, all our plants. One of my favorites it, are the many varieties of the Pyrus japonica. Uh, it's called mm. and called the lily of the valley bush. And what I love about them is that late winter they have flowers all over. And by the way, uh, great pollinator plant. I saw bumblebees all over one the other day, which was great. Oh. And um, when the flowers finish, the plant explodes into a deep burgundy, deep bronze, uh, reds, if you like. So, and it does this three times over the late spring and summer. So uh, if we go to the old thing of what is the, the thriller, what is the filler and what are the spillers? Um, <laughs> this is the thriller, no no question in terms of giving that, the, you know, eye, eye contact. Um, the second thing is when you have a, a beautiful plant like that, it's nice to accent it. And there's certain things that I love. One of my favorites for containers are the beautiful Nandinas, often called heavenly bamboos. It's kind of a good luck plant, uh, but they too, with new growth, depending on the variety, there's so many different varieties out there, but you see a lot of this beautiful bronze red new growth, which is uh, so pretty. And it complements uh, the Pierce, which are absolutely wonderful. The other thing that I'm uh, crazy about, and I'm going to ask them, we've talked about, uh, you know, in January, uh, the re resurgence of um, basically euonymus. Euonymus and the golds and the silvers and the bicolors and so on. But that silvery type of gold mixed in with the deep reds and burgundies wow. and, and uh, those red tones uh, kind of puts it together. Um, and now we're starting to get a picture of what, what, what it could look like. Um, the other thing that uh, grasses in here too are very important. Um, some of the Carex varieties uh, are nice because they're evergreen year round, uh, come in a wide range of colors today, which are great, but they have a lovely spill effect, which is just, you know, drooping gently over the edge of your pot to kind of soften the look, uh, which is kind of cool. And, um, and again, don't forget, there's many other plants. There's still some winter flowering heather. If you want a little bit of color in there, the winter flowering heathers would be good. But you know, a great one are the violas right now. Not the pansies, and you know the violas are out taking and out growing and, and out popularizing the pansies because they're smaller, uh, and they give you that little bit of a, a sense of a, a little pop of color, which is really good. So when you put these combinations together, and you know often what I do for folks who are not familiar with doing this, I just put them on the ground and I put them, I put them together, mold them around, move them around a little bit to get the look that I'm really looking for, and and then basically put them together in a pot as a look. And I gotta tell you, these are fabulous. I didn't mention the heucheras because today there are hundreds and hundreds of varieties of heucheras. Those are plants that have the most spectacular flower or foliage color. It's absolutely amazing. From your bronzes, your deep burgundies, the reds, the tan colors, so many different varieties which are um, absolutely just give you the contrast with all these other plants that I think make an amazing pop in terms of the color. And you know, the other thing, once this is all together, um, this is not something we, okay, it's spring now, we'll put some of our annuals in. Nope, 
these can last all summer long nice. and grow together and even through the winter time. But all of us need that little bit of a look right now. And using some of these broadleaf plants, some of the grasses, some of the heucheras, and you know, the odd perennial that really looks good, euphorbias right now with that lime, hot lime green flower uh, would fit in here nicely as well. So I guess if we're all looking for something that we can put outside right now, we'll take a frost or heavy frost, but still give us a long and beautiful look. And then again, don't forget two things. If you can get some little pieces of driftwood and bits and put in amongst it to give it that little bit of lift and added value. And then uh, some of the mini lights we like on, the battery operated lights that you just filter all through here. So when you get the, the night, uh, you know, we're oh. getting later now, which is good. Right. But you get this wonderful, uh, you know, beautiful fairy light, look, which is just amazing. So yeah, there's, there's some ideas that I think uh, would brighten everybody's spirit and really quite easy to do. And no throwaways, these are all permanent plants. And that's really important too. I mean, that's that's I mean, wonderful because then you, you're right. You're not thinking this this is short lived. Um, this is going to no. last all year, and it, it yep. is all thriller with Brian Minter here <laughs> on the show. <laughs> We're taking your questions to the Master Gardener one eight hundred eight two five five nine five zero six zero four six six nine three seven three three. You can hit pound six ninety on your cell phone. And let's get to our callers now. Ette is joining us from Langley. Welcome, Ette. Oh, hi, thank you. What's your question for Brian? Um, I have a circular area in the middle of my backyard that gets half a day of sun, but it borders onto a septic line. And my husband's concerned that, that anything I plant there will get into the septic line. I used to have dahlias there, but I don't want to do that anymore. So could I put a hydrangea or azalea or rhododendron or... What can I put there? Mm. Oh, Ed, that's a really good question. And you know, the, the thing is, uh, uh, I, I love the fact now, I had to ask the question though, between 10 o'clock and four o'clock in mm -hmm. the summertime, does it get sun or shade between that period or even some sun? Okay, the sun comes around 11 and, and mm -hmm. does go till like evening. Okay. Yeah. And, and thank you. That's that's really the critical question because yes. uh, a lot of sun loving plants will tolerate shade, yes. but a lot of shade loving plants just won't take that hot sun. Yeah. So uh, and, and I, I would really stick to a lot of perennials in there that yeah. uh, I think will give you and, and all these things are shallow rooted. So you don't have yes. to worry about them going too deep, which okay. is great. But when I have a circular area at yeah. what I always try and do is put a focal point in the center. Yes. something that captures your eye. Yes. And I love the Japanese willow, especially if they're grafted onto a standard form um, called Hakara Nishiki. It's mm -hmm. white and green variegated. And then in May, it's infused with pink. But as a focal point, it gives you right from early to late and then nice red branches in winter. It would be the focal point I would choose. Or there's some beautiful standard form or grafted lilacs, um, like the bloomerang, for example, that bloom twice. But something oh, okay. in the center, because it, it changes the whole nature. Yeah, and then when I have that... To the subject lines? No, no, it's no. a very shallow rooted. It, it, both okay. of these are very shallow rooted, not to worry. Okay, and so then the, the other thing... called again? Uh, bloom, uh, bloomerang. Like bloomerang. It, because okay, it bloom, great. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, when you have this, try and do things in threes around it. Yes. You know, put put groupings of three. Yes. Uh, for you know, for example, I'm crazy about the euphorbias right now. Yes. Uh, all of them are in bloom with those that beautiful chartreuse color. I would put the, uh, three of those around, yes. and, and I like things. And around the perimeter, yes. uh, I would get some. Uh, well, the, uh, the winter flowering heather just finished, so we'll kind of skip that right now. Yes. But uh, there there are some campanulas that I love. There's one that's uh, basically evergreen almost year round. It's yes. called Dixon's Gold around the perimeter because that it'll be low and bright gold. Yes. And then it's a question, you could even fit a few roses in here if you wanted, like three roses around. And all mm -hmm. I wanted to do at is give you an idea of a focal point in the center and then groupings of things in threes around it. Uh, it just looks so much more professional and mm -hmm. you've got dozens yes. of choices, but I think if you think this way, yes. it'll make a big difference for you. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you so much. So not hydrangeas. Well, in the hot afternoon sun, oh, yeah, uh, they're, they're not like going to they're not going to like that. And oh. the other ones, uh, the PGs that love the sun, take so long to bloom. We can yeah, do a lot yeah, better yeah. than that. OK, well, that's okay. Great. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Ate. Good luck to you. Thank you. Let's head to Callista now. And Diane has a question for Brian Minter. Hi, Diane. Oh, hi. 
Um, I lived through the fire. My yard didn't do that well. Mm. And I have mostly um, uh, evergreens around my house, which I'm removing. And I'd like some some sort of a privacy shrub that's fire smart. A great yeah. idea. No, good. Yeah, and thank you for that because you're reminding other people that unfortunately uh, close to the home our evergreens uh, are have resins in them and they they do explode um if you want some some height uh, up there and a bit of a screening uh, a couple of things i love uh, number one are the shrub dogwoods um the the whole family of corners the arctic fire um you know the, there's arctic sun beautiful red stems and, and yellow stems in winter so it's winter beauty as well but you know most of them get up to five six feet high uh, have beautiful foliage i think in the, in the summertime which are, are you know kind of great uh, i'd love to have some of those uh, along there i mean there's many other trees you could put in there as well i mean carragana is certainly one of the options out there but i love something that, that has more of a, an all season type of look and, you know, I think most of us need to look at some of our hardy flowering shrubs uh, up against the home. And I love things that which are longer flowering. Um, crazy about potentilla because a lot of new varieties are quite different than the old ones. Very strong repeat uh, flowering. Spireas would be great. I love the foliage of spireas. You know, the deep bronze color, the hot yellows. And, and of course, all of them flower for a long period of time, virtually all summer long. They are zone four and some going down to three. So you've got the hardiness right there. And one of my favorites uh, are the, um, oh, physiocarpus or what we call the nine bark. You should see some of the beautiful new colors, the chocolate brown, the ginger colors, the bright gold. Um, where you can't get evergreens, you can get these plants that have this amazing form and the bright colors of the foliage, which makes all the difference in the world. And you know, we talked about earlier um, to Ete about the lilacs. If you can, the, the beautiful Korean lilacs are wonderful and hardy for that as well. But uh, the bloomerangs are great because they bloom twice and they're hardy to be able to fit there. But they give you that long color and they do it again back in August and April. I mean, it's actually about the end of August is when they actually start to flower completely all over again. So look for plants with lots of colorful foliage, long blooming habit, hardy for the area which you're in. And of course, you've got a variation of heights there to give you screening. But there's some just suggestions for you that I think would make a really nice difference around your home. What? Oh, thank you. Um, could I also ask about something for a slope, uh, a ground cover? Because the fire came up from the creek to my house, mm. and uh, it's just totally burnt off. And I'm worried about uh, the stability of the slope. Yeah, and we, we get into a little bit of trouble there because uh, Arctostophilus uh, kinikinik uh, would always be my choice where you are because of its hardiness. But uh, it, it's really not a fire, uh, fire smart plant. That's that's the only thing that I, I would worry a, a wee bit about that. Uh, if you get enough sun, it sounds silly, but I would look at white Dutch clover uh, oh. for bank retention. It's really good uh, if you possible to mow it. If not, you could weed whack it, but uh, it might be a fast solution. But it's certainly tenacious and will help hold that bank together. Great. Uh, is, Diane? Uh, what about boxwood? Is it... Um really flammable yes it is i'm afraid yeah, yeah. it doesn't fit our, our fire smart category i'm <laughs> sorry diane oh, diane but i i so applaud you for looking for those fire smart options and a great reminder to um other british columbians as well i know whistler was doing some planning for wildfire season coming up uh, in the city there um and uh, uh your community is being affected by wildfire so that is such uh, something that really we need to keep in mind. Um, uh, good for you for for planning that, and I'm sorry that you yeah, have been uh, have been affected. Kathy is up next in Vancouver. Hi, Kathy. Hi, hi, Brian. Thank you for taking hi, my Kathy. call. You bet. Thank you for taking my call. Um, yeah, I have raised beds on a northeast facing deck, and mm -hmm. last year I planted tomatoes and peppers and I had no luck hmm. and this year um, my all of my beds are covered in moss so I have two questions um, one is the moss dangerous or can I can I, do I need to remove it before planting new plants and two which plants um, mainly vegetables don't need as much sunlight 
Yeah, both uh, Kathy, very, very good questions. Uh, let's get the moss out. You know, it, it's hard to get out of the lawn without using iron sulfate to, you know, kind of burn it off. Uh, but uh, I would say rake it out uh, as much as you can. But it's telling you two things. Uh, you need to put some lime to basically raise the pH of your soil. So that's one very important thing that I would uh, uh, keep in mind. Uh, so get the lime on. And I think you need a bit more coarse material in your soil. You need to open it up a bit more. Mm. Uh, I would look honestly at getting, if you can, if you have access to fir or hemlock sawdust. Uh, oh my gosh, it's so great at opening up raised beds and plants love it. I mean, it's not too acidic. They do great. So let's get the soil more open, get the pH up by putting lime on. That'll make a huge difference for you. And then uh, do you, and here's the, the key question we mentioned earlier, between 10 o'clock in the morning and three o'clock in the afternoon, do you get any sun on this Northeast corner? No, not much. Mm. Most of okay. my time is from 7 a.m. until about 11. Yeah. Okay. Okay, good, good point. So we're going to switch gears then. Uh, anything leafy would be absolutely fabulous there. Um, uh, all your lettuce varieties, your, your Swiss chard would be great. Spinach would be great. Uh, even the brassicas, cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, peas would be uh, happy in a spot like that. So anything that's sort of leafy uh, would is much easier because you'll, you'll get a pretty good crop. And don't forget if you get them nutrient and so on. But the one thing I, I always, in terms of uh, a landscape look or design, um, may put some tripods in these raised beds. In other words, uh, put three, three uh, bamboo canes, for example, together. And when you put your peas up there or anything else you want to run up, uh, it gives you a lift, that vertical lift that makes the whole area look better. So you're going to have to stay with the leafy stuff. Um, lots of wonderful okay. leafy stuff we can put in our gardens and uh, you'll be absolutely fine. And you'll have much better success. But let's get the lime on and a little bit of more openness in that soil. And between those two things, I think you'll have a great year ahead. That's, okay, that's, that's uh, Kathy, good luck to you. Thanks very much for the call. That sounds really encouraging because that's too bad that there was nothing, uh, you know, it didn't uh, grow for her last year. Uh, thanks so much yeah. for the call, Kathy. Uh, Lisa is up next now in Summerlin. Hi, Lisa. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Sure. Um, you bet. Um, I'm with the Invasive Species Society here in the Okanagan Shemelkameen. Uh -huh. And uh, Brian, as soon as you said the word euphorbia, all my uh, alerts go off. We've just been. Um, actively letting residents of the Okanagan Smelkameen know and with a reminder, as we do every spring, about Myrtle Spurge, or also known as Donkey Tail, which unfortunately has uh, has escaped many gardens here and it's moving into our grasslands and sagebrush areas and ponderosa pine forests. And we know it's toxic mm. with that uh, milky sap and we know that it is very invasive. Um, and there's other spurges that are invasive. So it was more uh, a comment that if you wouldn't mind just reminding listeners that um, not all the euphorbias, even though they're very attractive, um, we want to be cautious about what we put in our gardens because unfortunately they are still on our store shelves. Some of these invasive varieties, we, we actually had uh, myrtle spurge pop up um, uh, literally at the pop-up garden centers last year, there were three of them oh, in the big, Okanagan yeah. Milk Mean, and they were selling Myrtle Spurge. So yeah. um, I got a lot of phone calls, and we did they did uh, pull them off their shelves, but by law, they didn't have to. So, mm. yeah, if you can just... You know, and thank... It. Thank you for that, because uh, yeah. it's a billion dollar cost to uh, BC's economy, multi-billion dollar cost mm. in BC species. So you're so right. And but here's and here's the thing, and it does get confusing for the average folks. There are plants which are of the same species, which are, are invasive and other ones that are not. Mm. And, and I think as um, in, in the garden center industry, in the growing industry, too, I think we need to be more cognizant of the varieties that are not um, is invasive and promote those and, and the other ones must maybe back away from. Uh, but uh, you're absolutely right. And it's something we all need to keep in mind. And I, th I think everybody's, you know, awareness is one of the big thing. And I think the Invasive Plant Council does such an amazing job of uh, what you're doing, trying to help, um, absolutely. you know, virtually everybody. Uh, but th thank you for that reminder. So again, when you're looking at the Spurge or even Budley is for that example, there are many great varieties which are not, which are sterile or non-invasive and the same with the euphorbias. Those are the ones that you want to put in your garden. And that's a wonderful reminder. Thank you so much. Yeah, Lisa, thank you very much. And thank you for the work that you do in the Okanagan Samilkameen. Yep.
I've got this uh, early email from Shelly in Kamloops uh, about a clover lawn that they put in three years ago. And after last year's summer of hardly watering, it is extremely dry and has lots of weeds in a lot of areas. We typically reseed every year with micro clover and or regular cl clover. But what else can I do to help revive it? Yeah, a really good point. I mean, uh, we have to realize that no matter what we do for a lawn uh, and what we're going to grow, there are millions of weed seeds in our soils. And uh, the, the, right. once you start cultivating and working it up, you're saying to the weeds, OK, time to grow. Um, and that yeah. is an issue. Uh, so and, and I think there there are uh, just so you know today and it, they don't work as well. Uh, when the weather is cool, you need to have quite warm weather, like in the 15 to 20 degree range. Uh, there are weed control, which are organic. And, uh, you know, certainly for broadleaves and some of the less difficult weeds, you can get organic control, but you have to use um, the warmer temperatures. The other thing is really good is uh, mowing lower on our lawns all the time. Uh, when you mow lower uh, and mow in a different direction every time, uh, you know, you prevent them from uh, seeding. And that's the big thing. By mowing low, you stop this continual seeding going on and you get a, a real handle on it. And I love the fact that you're using clovers. That's that's wonderful. Yes. And it's the the micros do die down in wintertime. And that's something we have to remember. The white dutch might be better for you. But um, eventually, if you can really get the clover going uh, and encourage it and nurture it, it's going to choke out uh, so many of those weeds. Mm. So you mowing, mowing low and mowing in a different direction and mowing often uh, to, to keep the weeds from having a chance to seed. And the other thing is you can use organic weed control products uh, only when it's warm, but they are uh, not bad in terms of effectiveness to help you get some control. Okay. Thank you, Shelley, for the question. I'm going to squeeze in James in Vancouver. Uh, if you have 30 seconds to to even 20 seconds to ask your question, James. Yeah, thanks so much. I can't believe I got through uh, really quickly. I took on a challenge and have a lemon tree, mm -hmm. um, and it's not really happy, and I think it's bugs, but I can't see them. There's like little spittle. The leaves look unhappy, but there is flower and fruit. I just don't okay. know what to do with this lemon tree. Mm. Might be bugs. Yeah, um, again, as soon as you can now, get them outside in a protected area. Uh, they do so much better than being indoors. So that if, as soon as we can, I would say another week or two, possibly, um, the horticultural oil is going to be your best friend. Um, James, this is really important. It's organic. Uh, we use it and use the growing season ratio. But gosh, we're starting to use it everywhere and having very successful control. You can't use it once. You need to use it two or three times in succession on the foliage. And um, it, it just gives you great control. We're getting mealybug control and so many other insects that are just hard to, to deal with. But uh, regular springs of uh, horticulture okay. oil, five to seven days apart. Keep and, at it, uh, James. Uh, Brian, yep. thank you.